Hello and welcome to Inside Intercom. I'm Liam Geraghty. Uh, today we are looking at a very specific area of customer service, one that touches all of us at some point during our lives, and that's healthcare, which is why I'm delighted to be joined by Jennifer Fitzpatrick, author of the new book, Reimagining Customer Service in Healthcare. Jennifer has worked in healthcare since she was 16, so really has a wealth of insight into customer service in this very unique space. Jennifer, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thanks so much, Liam. Before we get started, I'd love just to hear a bit about your career journey to this point. As I mentioned there, you started you know, out when you were 16 in the space. Where did it start? Well, I worked in a nursing home when I was 16, back when it was really hard to get a job and get a job in healthcare, actually. So it was a really fabulous learning experience just to work in a nursing home. I worked at, as a receptionist, but I also really enjoyed being around the residents and so when somebody would call out if they needed help with the residents i would be brought in and with actually very little training so i got training on the job and so then i really enjoyed working with older adults and in the healthcare space so i wound up majoring in social work and my big goal at that point was i wanted to be a nursing home administrator i didn't even realize that there were all these other things that you could do so i went and got a degree in social work got a master's degree in social work and of course found out that the healthcare space is so much bigger and wider and i've done kind of almost everything you can imagine from administrative work to it, it marketing and sales to actually clinical work you know i've been a therapist uh i've been in so many different aspects of healthcare but about 20 years ago i started teaching college also as an adjunct at, in health sciences gerontology and then i from there I, I opened up my speaking and consulting business so i've had the pleasure of working with all kinds of hospitals and senior living and hospice and home care and doctor's offices. And it's been a really amazing thing to watch healthcare change in, I'm going to be 50, in all those three decades. Wow. Your new book, Reimagining Customer Service in Healthcare, why did you want to write the book in the first place? I think, I, th I wrote, so I wrote a first book called Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One. And that book was for people like you and I, if we're taking care of an older loved one or a family member that's sick. So I wanted, to, so that was really for the consumer. And I wanted to come at healthcare from the angle of the people that are providing the care. I wanted to talk to them. I wanted to talk to their leaders, their CEOs, their operations, see, uh, you know, their chief operating officers. I wanted to talk to every level at healthcare of, what can you do if somebody is a patient or a client, whatever they call them, resident if you're in senior living, but also for families, how do you make the experience better? Because all of us know you are an expert in health, in, in, in customer service. You know that customer service is, is an art and healthcare is a science, but it's also a business. And I wanted to talk about the art of healthcare. Because I think people think, well, a lot of administrators, a lot of chief executives, they think about the bottom line, which they're supposed to. And the clinicians think, okay, well, if you have a broken bone, we want to fix the bone. So that's the, the science part and the business part. But the art part is how do you make that person feel comfortable? How do you make it so that person isn't terrified? Because going into healthcare, mental health, senior living, any aspect of this field is really stressful. It's not like going out for dinner. Yeah. And like what in the introduction to the book, you kind of give this like stark statement, which is, you know, your patients and clients hate that they need you. <laughs> Why is that? Well, if you're if you're interfacing with any health or mental health provider, you don't really want to be there. If you have a urinary tract infection, you wish you didn't. If you have depression, you wish you did it. If you were in a horrible car accident, you are not happy that that happened. And so they hate the idea that they need us. They, they, they do need us, but no one's saying, yes, I get to move my mom to assisted living or awesome. 
I get to go have surgery. Nobody is thinking that. Whereas for other areas of customer service, let's say we're going to go shopping at Nordstrom. I enjoy that. I look forward. Oh, I get to walk around. It's even if I don't buy anything, it's window shopping. It's fun. Or if I go out to a nice dinner. Yes, I'm excited about that. It's not the same thing in healthcare. And so we have a lot more to live up to. The stakes are really much higher. Is it possible to turn that around and have, you know, customers, clients, patients be, uh, as you say, grateful instead of hateful? Yeah, absolutely. It, so when we go in and we're not feeling comfortable, we're worried, we're stressed, we're anxious. A lot of times we're beating ourselves up. I should have lost weight. I should have stopped smoking. I whatever, or I, I shouldn't have been driving so fast if I was in a car accident, whatever it is that we, we have in our heads. When somebody says, Hey, these, this, these things happen to people, you're human. We can help you. We can, when we get into that headspace where we're able to calm the person, make them feel welcome, make them feel not only do their clinical outcomes improve that, that the science is demonstrated that, that they actually get better faster, but they're going to write better reviews for you. They're going to complain less. So be pa less pains in the neck for you to have to deal with as administrators who are dealing with phone calls and online reviews that are awful. There's less chance that there's going to be malpractice, which everybody wants. So yeah, there's a lot of opportunity. It's not just what's in it for the patient or the client, but it's what's in it for you. What's what makes your business or your organization run smoother. I imagine there's probably some healthcare leaders and clinicians out there who believe that they should just like focus on the, the clinical outcomes, you know, that there's no point in improving customer service. What would you say to those folks? That the data is really clear that when you focus on, it doesn't take a lot of time. It takes a little bit of energy to build that rapport, to make the person feel a little bit more comfortable. And so the data demonstrates that when you do that, that you actually do get better clinical outcomes. So it's inner, it, it, it's all interdependent. So it's not, yes, you can heal the broken bone or you can perform the surgery beautifully, but when that person goes into the surgery and they, they feel trust, they feel comfort, they feel that they're in good hands, their outcomes are better. And so your job, so there are, like you said, Liam, there's so many people that are like, this is a bunch of crap. I didn't go to charm school. I went to medical school. <laughs> so, but if, if for those people, I say it does make a difference. It's going to actually make your job easier, even if it's just a placebo effect. And mm -hmm. um, I'd love to talk about COVID just for a minute. Like the, there was so many new policies, you know, introduced during the pandemic, how has that impacted the client and patient mindset? Well, a lot of trust in the United States has been lost because there was so many mixed messages. And frankly, Liam, from day one, I, I was somebody that was outspoken about the leadership was panicked. It was, ah, nobody was like, it's going to be all right. We're going to get through this. I never heard that come from a leader. It was all just, you should be scared. You should be scared. And so even if everybody has their own opinion on what happened in the last three years, <laughs> but even if it was the bubonic plague, I would have liked to have seen the leaders say, listen, we're going to be okay to have a calm messaging. And that did not happen from, from, and this isn't about any political party. I don't, I didn't see that really happen from any leader that spoke to the public. So, that so there's there's actually robert wood johnson and harvard did a big study I, I think it was in the middle of 2021 like when we were halfway through all this that the trust in cdc went down fda nih that and and i think that that has an impact not just forget about the COVID stuff forget about masks forget about vaccines forget about all that lockdowns but now that people are like okay well are they right about getting a mammogram are they right about getting a childhood vaccines are they i think people a lot of people because there's distrust they're they're rethinking things maybe that have a lot of backed up science to say yeah you should get a mammogram so just in terms of transforming the mindset of those people 
the clients and the patients. How do we go about doing that? Or how do medical professionals, healthcare professionals uh, go about doing that? Because it's such a big challenge. Listen, you need to listen when your patients and clients, first of all, forget about like the baby boomers and older. So I'm a Gen Xer. Baby boomers and older, uh, sorry, people older than baby boomers. So traditionalists, the oldest old of our population. To a certain extent, they still have a very strong deference to physicians and healthcare providers. Why? Because that age group is the least educated academically of every population that's ever lived. So they they have this mindset like, oh, they know better, they know best. Every generation that's come after does not have that same deference. And so they do their own reading. Now, I know a lot of docs, a lot of healthcare providers will say, don't look up your symptoms, don't. And, and that's good advice for a lot of people, especially if they have an anxiety problem, right? Because then they go down rabbit holes maybe. But let's say your client or patient comes in and says, I read this journal article that about what my condition is. I, I read a book by a, an expert about something that my loved one's going through and they want to discuss it. Do not blow them off. It's really quite insulting. So I, during this pandemic time, I think we heard people, you've got to listen to the experts. They have to have an MD. You have to, well, think about it, like for money. When I go to see my financial professional, I don't just blindly say, oh, I'll do anything you want. That's silly. I need to participate in the conversation with my financial professional. Where are my goals? What have I read? What are my risk tolerances? The same is to be said for when you interact with your health or mental health professional. It's your body, it's your life. Just like when you go to your financial professional, it's my money, it's my retirement. And so I don't think it's ever fair to say, well, the patient should just do what we say. First of all, they, they deserve to participate. And also, I hate to say this because a lot of healthcare providers are very resistant to this idea. Healthcare providers are very busy. Sometimes they, especially if they, they might have read more about the topic than you have, especially if you're in a, say like a primary care situation. You know, primary care doctor has to treat chicken pox, but they also have to treat broken bones and they have to treat multiple sclerosis. Now, if you've got say, allergies to a certain food, maybe you've really read a lot more about allergies to that food than that doc has. So I think it's, it's about partnership. It's about looking at your patient or your client as a partner, and it shouldn't be this authoritative attitude. Something you don't usually hear people in healthcare saying uh, that they want something to be contagious, <laughs> but something uh, worth spreading uh, that you say in your book is, is what you call a contagious cam camaraderie culture. Um, what do you mean by that? So a contagious camaraderie culture is you can't do any of this with your clients, your patients, your residents until you have a team that feels good about working at your organization. And so I think a lot of organizations say, ah, our reviews are bad, or we just got dinged on a, on a survey that we did. We got to fix all this. And you really can't, it's all interdependent. You got to make sure that your team feels good about working there. And I write a lot about my experiences working in healthcare when I wasn't treated at least in my opinion, I wasn't treated like a human being by a boss when I worked at a healthcare organization. And for example, like I was going through a caregiving situation, I had a death in the family and I was, there wasn't a lot of grace given to me during this situation. And I didn't feel like I could give my best to our patients during that time. That's just common sense. But so many providers, so many chief executives feel like, well, you know what? we'll just fix the customer service. People are not in the headspace to fix customer service or make the experience better until they feel like I'm being taken care of, that you care about me as a, as a human being. And I think a lot of Gen Xers and boomers and traditionalists who are still in the workplace, because we do still have traditionalists in the workplace. Think about, think about the US president is a traditionalist, right? So people, oh, they're retired. No, they're not, not, not always. 
But those age groups, and Gen X, I'm a Gen Xer myself, I think we're a little jealous of the millennials and the Gen Zs that come into the workplace and say, treat me like a person. Because we came into the workplace and we didn't, we just did what we were told. And so I think we're learning a lot from the younger generations on how to treat people better. But I think there's still a little bit, you should pay your dues kind of nonsense that the older generations sometimes do to the younger generations. I, I suppose for healthcare providers like listening in to us, um, how do they put all of this together, what we've been talking about? Like, what do their teams need to know? The first thing that they need to truly feel, they need to know, but they also need to feel that you and your organization care about them, that they're not just a body filling a task, that you know them as a human being. Now, yeah, you have to have certain standards of what this, you know, they can't be calling out every day. They can't be late when it's really, you know, there's important things going on, but they need to believe that if they they have a personal emergency, a true emergency that you're going to, you're going to treat them like a person. They, they have a sick child. They're sick themselves. They have a caregiving situation. We, if, if, I've seen people be sometimes short-sighted about that, that they don't want to give a little bit of grace. And the, the more you invest in treating your team the way you or the, the way that you would treat your you would hope to treat your patients, the, they're going to give you more. They're going to be more loyal when they go to Glassdoor and other websites like that to write about their experience. If they do leave and go somewhere else, they're going to write nice things. They're not going to say avoid this employer like the plague. And I think there, to, to to credit, there's a lot. And I interviewed a 20 C suite execs for the book. There are lots of organizations doing really cutting edge stuff. For example, there's an organization, a senior living organization it's called Silverado, that they have a policy on bringing your kids to work. And I'm not saying that that would work everywhere or for every employee or for every child, but they're trying it and they're, they're making it a possibility and think about that. Oh my gosh, my employee, I don't have to worry about childcare. Now it's not just bring your kids in and they run rampant. It's, it's very awkward, but it is a way that they're they're It's a, it's a benefit that they are allowing some employees to utilize. That's great. Um, it's, it's such an amazing benefit and, and it's great to be open, you know, to, to, like you say, trying it out. What advice would you give to people experiencing those clients, patients, um, who are what you call in the, the book, hateful, no matter what. Yeah. It's people that fall into that always difficult category. First thing is try to figure out. So if it's somebody that's always complaining, they're never happy. They, they're calling you at all hours. You feel like you're never going to satisfy them. One thing is try to figure out why is there a substance abuse problem? So, so what I'm saying is it might not be anything to do with why you're treating them. You might be treating them for a broken leg, but their behavior is because it could be because of a substance abuse problem. It could be a mental health problem, like a personality disorder, narcissistic, borderline. It could be, there could be so many different reasons. Try to pinpoint what could be going on with this person and acknowledge it. You don't necessarily need to acknowledge it to that person, depending on what you're treating them for, but you do need to acknowledge, okay, this is probably somebody that's got something else going on besides why we're treating them. We're not here to, help them with their narcissism. We're here to help them with their broken foot. What do we, we just need to acknowledge it, but also getting everybody on the same page. Don't allow the staff to be split on how to manage the situation. So if let's say your organization, I'm just throwing this out as an example, let's say your organization only has hours from nine to five and your policy is that the person call the, go to the hospital after five o'clock don't be making exceptions. Make sure everybody's on the same page. We all, if this person's contacting you, just remind them, have your out of office be, please call the emergency room or go to the emergency department. So being on the same page and just acknowledging that there's something else going on with this person, but also you still want to use the basic customer service principles that I talk about in reimagining customer service in healthcare. You still want to be nice. You still want to smile. You still want to be polite. You still want to treat them like a human being just because there's something going on with that person that they maybe are never going to be happy. Doesn't mean that basic customer service doesn't deescalate it a little bit. So 
the other thing is just don't get into a power struggle. I see a lot of times people, I think our own countertransference sometimes gets triggered where we maybe you had a parent that behaved like that, or you, you have an ex spouse that behaved like that. And oh, I'm not going to take this crap from this person. And you wind up in a power struggle that can lead to a lot of problems, including malpractice claims So deal with it. Some of the stuff that you, you mentioned there kind of leads on to my uh, next question. Um, I was going to say like, we have, so many customer support leaders from all kinds of industries, you know, who watch and listen to this show. And I was wondering if you think there are any lessons from customer service in healthcare that folks in other industries would find useful. I'm so glad you asked that, Liam, because I do believe that this book is for everybody. Because the, to me, healthcare is the hardest one to make people feel good and feel satisfied. And so if you can take a, there are so many lessons that you can say, I can apply this to my restaurant. I can apply this to my funeral home. I can apply this to my plumbing business because it's way harder to please somebody who's just coming out of a surgery than it is to please somebody who you're coming in to fix their cable or their internet because the, the problems are typically much simpler. The people are less stressed out. I know internet outage seems like the end of the world, it, but it's not a heart surgery. <laughs> but yeah, I do believe because we're talking about some of the most serious situations that everybody can glean a little bit from the ideas that health, the, some, the, the C-suite leaders that I talked to really gave some great ideas. The, the other thing that I want to just share, because I think it's relevant to every industry, is that there was this big study that I share in the book about uh, a study about Yelp reviews and surgeons. And people are reviewing their surgeons on Yelp now. I mean, it's not just they're sending an, an, a nasty email to the hospital administrator. And the, the main thing, it's not that they, their heart didn't work anymore, work. It's not that their bone didn't get fixed. It's because the surgeon wasn't nice to them. And so if we can take that lesson back to all of our industries, making eye contact, smiling. And I know when I, when I, and I do so many trainings and keynotes about this, and I will get people rolling their eyes. I'm telling you, they're not, if, if you don't observe your staff doing it, they're not doing it. Mm -hmm. 100%. I mean, before we wrap up, I have to ask you about AI. Um, what are your thoughts on how AI might transform customer service and support in healthcare? Well, you've already probably seen the study that indicated that AI was giving more empathic responses to patients than actual, there, there was just a study out, it, it's, it, which is scary, but because they already start out with, you know, oh, hi, I come in, I'm, I've got this going on. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not feeling well. How often does your provider say that to you? But the AI is saying that right away. They're not just like, all right, let's get down to business. So, and again, it's not about a lot of time. It's about just like taking that energy, like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So I think it's, a, it's potentially gonna be a great tool to use, especially for people that it doesn't come so naturally to, because some of us are more naturally empaths than others. And so it could be a great tool all right, well, when this person comes in, so I, I, I think it'll be really interesting to see where AI takes us, but definitely, a, I think potentially a really good tool for people where that empathy, that bedside manner isn't a natural part of their personality. And that's okay if it's not, it can be developed. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I, I'd never thought of that angle on it. Um, that's yeah, that's a, it could be super useful there. Um, and, and lastly, where can our listeners go to keep up with you and your work? Yeah, uh, reimagining customer service and healthcare is on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere books are sold, and also uh, jenniferfitzpatrick.com, Generations Gen, Generations with a J, GenerationsHealth.com, Generations with a J. Uh, love to hear from you. Jennifer, thank you so much for talking with me today. Thanks, Liam.